the topics that we are going to cover today. We're gonna to talk about thinning fruit. We're gonna talk about watering, pruning, fertilizing, and pests. And as I mentioned, I'm gonna stop at the end of each section to check in with you all and see if you have any questions. So let's talk about thinning fruit. So first of all, why would we thin or selectively remove fruit from the tree? Why would we wanna do that? So thinning involves, as I said, removing that excess fruit from the tree. What it does in the long term is it increases fruit size because you have fewer fruit that the tree is needing to put its energy into. It also potentially reduces diseases such as brown rot, which is that brown rot at the bottom of a fruit. It reduces alternate bearing as well. And that's when a fruit tree will tend to have a really, a lot of fruit, a heavy load one year. And then the next year, they, it might have little to no fruit and then another heavy year and then another light year you can to some extent reduce that tendency by thinning. Um, and then it also reduces limb breakage because sometimes you get so much fruit on a limb that it's too heavy and the limb will snap. And that's especially common for really heavy fruit like peaches. So that's why you would do it. How would you do it? So there are two kind of broad methods hand thinning and pole thinning. So hand thinning is what it sounds like. It's when you remove these little fruits by hand and is the most thorough because you're up close and personal and it's you can select exactly which one you're gonna remove, but it is more time consuming. So what you do is you selectively eliminate small and damaged fruit by twisting or cutting the stem between, with your fingernails, um, or you could use clippers. And this is easier to do on smaller trees. Like I, I did this on my fruit tree or my peach tree a couple of months ago and it's only like six feet tall. So it was, it was pretty quick. Um, or you can do pole thinning. And this is a little bit uh, easier when you have a particularly tall tree. And so what you can do is you can cut a short piece of old hose and like stick it, like push it down on the end of like a mop handle or some other handle and use that to reach up and strike individual fruit or clusters of fruit or the base of a branch and when you hit it you're you knock some of the fruit off so it's quicker but then doing everything one fruit at a time um, but it's not selective right and you could potentially damage other fruit but but it works and especially if you have a really tall fruit tree and it's too dangerous to get up you know, on a ladder this is is definitely effective so the question is, so when do you do this? Now we're, for most fruit trees, I will say we're a little bit past the time now. Um, you typically do this in spring or early summer. So you might wanna think about this for your fruit trees next year, potentially. Although if you have a fruit tree that has tons of fruit, even though, even if they're large and you see that the branches are starting to to really get weighed down, you could still thin some fruit off to keep the branches from breaking. So it's not gonna, it's not gonna hurt anything and you might protect your tree doing it now, but typically it's done earlier. And typically you thin when the fruit are about three quarters to an inch in diameter. So about the size of a quarter, that's kind of the ideal time. Um, and then a lot of people will ask, well, what's the spacing? So how do I know how far apart to thin, like, you know, so that depends on tree vigor, but that's kind of hard to sometimes determine, especially if you're newer at this. So some rules of thumb are that as the fruit grow, as you imagine how big they're gonna get, you should think ultimately they shouldn't touch each other, rub together at harvest when they reach their full size. So common rule of thumb is to leave about four to six inches between the fruit after you're done thinning. So if you look at the pictures on the right and you see the picture on the upper right and the fruit are kind of clustered together, they're like twin fruits in some case. And then you look down below, that's after thinning the lower picture. And you can see, look how nicely spaced out the fruit are when they're left. And I would guess they're about four to six inches between those fruit. So that's what you're aiming for. Specifically for apples, you want to thin to one fruit per cluster or every six inches. And for pears, 
you also want to thin to one fruit per cluster. Uh, but for those of you who have Bartlett pears, they actually typically don't need thinning, so you wouldn't have to worry about that. So let me pause there. That's fruit thinning. That was kind of a quick overview. Do you have any questions? Do you want me to review anything again? Go back to a previous slide. Just let me know. So far, I don't see anything in the chat. But again, if you guys want to unmute or you have any questions, um, feel free to type those in. But it's so important as a master gardener, we so often get the question, you know, my fruit was so small this year. And a lot of time it's from a lack of thinning. So this is a really important point. Thanks, Holly. Yeah. Oh, and then uh, is citrus tree thinning the same is a question in the chat. Yeah, it's really interesting. Um, citrus trees often do a bit of their own thinning um, and they'll have what's known as a June drop. Sometimes it's a May drop where a bunch of the immature free, uh, fruit that the tree can't support will drop. Um, and so, um, you know, Maggie, feel free to jump in, but like you, you often don't hear about people talking about fruit tree thinning for citrus, but you certainly can do it, especially if you see that there are so many fruit that they're going to be small and that the branches are going to bend down. So I'll give you an example. I was too overwhelmed last year to thin my uh, tangerine tree and the fruit got away from me. They were too large and all the branches were literally touching the ground. They were so heavy. And so, I mean, in that case, I probably should have thinned it. So there's certainly, I, there's nothing wrong with thinning citrus. It's just people don't tend to talk about that as much. Yeah, and I would disagree. You know, usually you have a May or a June drop and that's the way the trees sort of thin themselves out. Um, but, and, and sometimes it's like 50% of the fruit. It can be quite striking. But you're absolutely right. We get a lot of questions also to the helpline that their branches broke or they're overburdened. So you definitely want to be careful, especially if you have growth that might have been, if, if that branch is maybe like a, what they call a water sprout or it's not very solid, it may not be able to support the weight. So you would definitely, and same thing for avocados. You don't really hear about thinning avocados and we're usually lucky to get an avocado crop. But anytime you see that branch being overburdened, there's a definite possibility if a wind event comes or just the fruit as it matures, um, then um, it might need to be thinned. Yeah. And yeah, so the person said, I have a grapefruit with a big fruit, um, but they have not dropped on their own. So as long as the tree can support it, um, but it is something to be mindful of. Yeah, exactly. Like I would keep an eye on it because if you just start to see the branches of your grapefruit tree really, really bending down and getting overloaded and you're worried that they might break, it might be time to go in and just remove some of the fruit. All right, I'm gonna move ahead. So let's talk about watering, which is really a huge deal right now, given everything that we're going through in California with the mega drought and with watering restrictions. So, I know that everyone's having to cut back quite a lot on watering, well, depending on your jurisdiction, but I think it's it's broadly applicable across the state. And um, one of the things that we do recommend is you think about where to use your water, the water that you are allowed to use, where are you, where are you gonna apply it? And we typically recommend to use your water on your trees and save your trees. Um, maybe maybe let your lawn die or some of the other things die, but trees are really, really valuable resources for the environment, for cooling the area around your home, et cetera. So um, if you're gonna choose, we would say choose your trees. So trees do need to be watered deeply and consistently. And we'll talk more about what that means. Consistently doesn't always mean frequently. It doesn't mean like watering your tree every day. And in fact, that could be a bad thing. Um, but how often you water does depend on what type of soil you have. So if you have really sandy soil that drains quickly, you're going to have to water more often than if you have really heavy clay soil that holds water for a longer period of time. And only you know your own soil. Um, and the trees should be allowed to dry slightly, say in the top couple inches of soil before watering again. And the reason for this is it can help keep certain pathogens, that is diseases, down. It can reduce um, the likelihood that your tree will get certain diseases. Um, so here's some possible things to consider, but 
there isn't really a one size fits all approach to watering. I know that's one of the, the most frequently asked questions is about water. How often do I water? How much do I water? And it really depends on a number of things that we're gonna talk about. But here's some ideas. So for newly planted trees, they, they really depend on water to get established. They're just babies. Their root systems haven't really grown out yet. And so you may need to water them about two times a week maybe more if it's over 100 degrees. For trees that are a little older and more established, they can get away, like say three to five years, they could get away with approximately once a week. Um, again, if your soil isn't super sandy. And then large trees might be able to get by um, with twice a month watering. Now, some of you might look at this with the newly planted trees and say, how do I water twice a week? I'm only allowed to water one day a week. Like some people are under those restrictions. Well, I would say to check with your city or your jurisdiction because most, in most places, there are no watering restrictions like one time per day for drip irrigation and for hand watering or watering with a hose with a shutoff, you know, like if you have one of those nozzles. And so you may be able to find a workaround there. Um, but you do, as I mentioned, you have to consider your conditions in your area and this can be tricky like when you decide how often and how much to water. So as I mentioned, you have to think about your soil type. Is it more sandy? Is it more clay? Is it somewhere in the middle? And you have to think about exposure to wind and to sun. If your tree is on a southwest facing slope where it's getting the hottest sun all day long, it's going to need more water than if it's on the east side of your house and it's just getting morning sun and then gets shade the rest of the day. If it's exposed to the worst of those Santa Ana winds, the winds are gonna dry it out faster and so it's gonna need more water. Also, the humidity is really low, trees are gonna need more water. If there's a sudden heat wave and a jump in temp, like maybe next week it gets to be 115 where I am, now it's a, 101, um, you know, the tree's gonna need more water. The other thing you have to consider is how you're irrigating. Are you using drip, are you using sprinklers, are you using the hose? Because how much water you can apply at one time is gonna vary depending on the type of irrigation system you have. So I realize that this is complicated. There are a lot of factors to consider. And so the thing that I recommend is that if you have questions and you wanna help you want help figuring this out, the Master Gardeners can help you. This is what we love to do. This is what we volunteer for. And so later on in the presentation, I'm we're gonna give you um, links and our phone number for our helpline. And if you're just, if your tree isn't doing well, and you're not sure if it's due to watering and you want more info, just, just reach out to us. But I would say your, your best indicator is plant performance. So if your tree is looking good, it's nice and green, it's holding its fruit, doesn't have any, illness or injury, then you're probably doing pretty well. But if you notice that your tree is having problems then do reach out to us and we can help you figure out, is it watering? And if so, then how can, how can you improve your watering? Um, so in terms of irrigation, the best type of irrigation, um, best types are drip and micro sprinkler, but you could do furrow irrigation where you flood a furrow with water. You could create kind of a berm and a ring around the tree and flood that ring with water. Um, you could use regular sprinklers. Those are just a little less efficient. Um, the worst location is in the middle of a lawn because honestly, the lawn takes a lot of the water from the tree. But the idea is to water deeply, as I mentioned, and as in not every day. Okay, when I say infrequently, I'm gonna don't do it every day. And kind of think about how much water your tree might need. So a small tree is gonna need a lot less water than a large tree. So a two-year-old tree that's relatively tiny could use two gallons a day, and a mature tree could use more than 50 gallons a day. And again, your best indicator is plant performance because you're not always gonna be able to do exact calculations, right? But what you see in this graph here is you see how big the tree is kind of on the, on the bottom horizontal line there and that's canopy diameter. So how wide is the canopy? And then on the vertical axis or the, the vertical line on the left, you see gallons per day. And you see that as the canopy or the size of the tree increases, gallons per day goes up. 
and more so in the summer, that's the orange line or the orange bar, more so in the summer than the spring or fall, which is the um, red bar there. And so the point of this is just to tell you as your tree gets bigger, it's gonna need more water and it's gonna need the most water in the summer. So usually you have to adjust your watering over the course of the year as well. When you water, really big no-no, don't let water pool around the trunk like you see here. Uh, at my house, the previous owners planted a bear's lime tree in a depression, a uh, little like kind of bowl <laughs> shape in the earth. And it was also heavy clay soil and water would pool. And it was too big for me to move. And it died of crown rot because the water was sitting around the trunk and I had to, I had to replace it. And I planted the new lime tree elsewhere uh, because that was not a good spot. So definitely try to avoid that. Also, this can help with retaining water, which is really important right now, is using mulch. Mulch is huge. It keeps the roots cool, keeps the soil shaded, does all sorts of things, but it helps retain moisture and prevent water loss. So, but do try to keep the mulch away from the trunk of the tree. So like maybe three to six inches away. And you can see that in the picture on the bottom right, there's a happy tree and you see the little dip right around the trunk where the mulch doesn't like push up against the trunk. And then the far right, you see what we call a mulch volcano. Um, that is not good. Don't put the mulch right up against the trunk like that. Um, but anyways, there are a lot of, a lot of benefits to mulch, but what's important here is it helps conserve moisture. Okay, let me stop there. What questions do you all have about watering? It's a tricky topic. Let's see. So uh, one person just chimed in, uh, definitely mulch, 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 mulch. And then um, uh, and then there was a question, if we can maintain a tree under eight feet, is this a good idea? Um, and um, I don't know if that was in relation to the watering technique or I don't know if you want if you want to unmute you can um or you can uh, retype the question I apologize so it says if we can maintain the tree under eight feet is this a good idea oh I, I see unmuted or they didn't I was basing that on the chart that was provided it shows all the way up to 25 feet the the higher the tree is the more water so if you keep your tree at a certain height is that just a better idea if that's possible? Yeah, that's a really good question. And so the graph's referring not necessarily to height, but to diameter. So the, actually the width of the canopy, but you're right that the width of the canopy is usually related to also how tall it is, right? It's just a bigger tree overall. Um, if you keep your tree smaller, it's true that it will use less water because it has a smaller leaf canopy, but you also have to think about the type of tree that you're dealing with and is that is it appropriate based on that type of tree's growth habit and natural size to keep it pruned down so small um, and also you have to think about how much work you want to put in so some trees want to grow very large and you might have to prune pretty excessively multiple times a year just to keep it that small um, we're going to talk about pruning up later but you know you also have to think about if you keep pruning are you going to be exposing the branches and trunk to too much light and causing sunburn. So it's one of those things that it, I get what you're saying and yeah, it can reduce water use by keeping the trees smaller, but what might be the best thing to consider is when you're planting trees, planting fruit trees that are on dwarf or semi-dwarfing rootstock, which keeps the canopy smaller overall and then it'd be easier for you to maintain so that you're not having to prune constantly and, and deal with that. So does that answer your question? Yeah, it sounds like, yep, and yeah, agreed that, um, you know, it's nice to keep a tree, you know, if you can keep a tree under 12 feet, if you're not inheriting some older tree, it will definitely be a lot easier maintenance, um, and, and even dwarfs will go up to 15 feet, they'll still need some pruning, but um, definitely helps keep all those resources used down, keeps you off ladders and everything, so yeah, but it sounds like, yep, we're all set. Okay, all right. Um, so let's talk about pruning. That was a great segue, Nikisha. Okay, um, so we, I'm going to talk about pruning of trees kind of at different stages of their life and also for kind of different purposes. 
So let's start with summer pruning of young trees. And the first thing I wanna mention is that summer pruning is often a really surprising and foreign co a concept to a lot of people, maybe not you all, but to a lot of people because I think we're used to being told that you can only prune fir trees, especially deciduous ones that drop their leaves in the winter, especially only pruning them in the winter. And the thinking has changed over the years on this. And so now um, it is recommended to do summer pruning. Um, and in some cases, you really need to do pruning only in the summer, but we'll get there. So for summer pruning of young trees, the purpose, if you choose to do this, is to promote the growth of what we call scaffold branches. So these are branches that as the tree gets older, they're going to become the main scaffold of the tree. They're gonna become major structural trunk-like branches that originate off the trunk. So they're gonna create the framework of the tree. And so this type of pruning promotes that. And the way you promote that is you identify any shoots or smaller little shoots that are coming off that you don't really want and you head them back, cut them back to four to six inches. Um, and then you see it, you, you locate branches that are or shoots that are like two feet long and you pinch them back to promote side branching if you wanna create, because what happens when you, when you pinch or cut them off, you're gonna promote new side branches to grow below that point where you cut it back. And so you can kind of manipulate your tree a little bit and you see a branch and you're like, I want some side branches there. I want it to branch out. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna cut it back a little bit. And what this does in the long run is it reduces the time that it takes to train your fruit tree because you're doing it in the summer too. And then also it can potentially shorten time to first fruit production, which as we all know is something we wait eagerly for when we put in that young fruit tree. So that's for young trees. When you're talking about mature trees, uh, the purpose changes a little bit when you're doing summer pruning. So one purpose is to increase sunlight and productivity of lower fruiting wood. So what do I mean by this? So for fruit trees, for many types of fruit trees anyways, they need some sort of light to penetrate into the interior of the tree to promote fruiting and productivity. You don't want too much light because you don't want sunburn, but you want sunlight to penetrate into the canopy. Um, and that can promote fruit production later on. You also do this in the summer to control the size and the shape of the tree. So what you do in the summer is you identify unwanted, really vigorous, upright shoots. You can also find crossing branches if you want, and you cut them out. And you can do this one or two times in the summer. And you can also bring down the tree's height. And I, I was actually doing this to my apricot tree like just a few days ago. And I was doing it to actually bring down the tree height because I wanna be able to reach the apricots and I'm five feet tall and I don't really like ladders. And so I was using my lockers to bring down the height of the tree by about four feet. And that also did allow some light to penetrate the interior as well. So those are the goals for mature trees. And this is just an example of a plum tree, which they grow wildly, they do need pruning. So the before pictures in the upper left and you see that um, these are quite vigorous overgrown trees in the summer. And then they were pruned and then you look at the bottom right picture and notice how the height has been brought down substantially. It's gonna be much easier to harvest fruit off these trees the next season. And then notice you can kind of see more of the branches. You can see some more light getting in there. Not too much, because again, we don't want sunburn happening, but enough to promote some production. Now, one thing, the reason why I was pruning my apricot in August is because in California, you are supposed to prune apricots and cherries in August. And that is in order to avoid certain diseases such as you type of dieback. So you actually should not be pruning your apricots and cherries in the winter at all. It can make them susceptible to disease. 
Now, some people like to have fruit bushes and you can see a picture of a fruit bush next that this guy is standing next to in the lower right there. So you can keep them really small. This kind of gets at Nikisha's question, like, you know, keeping trees small, oh, this is definitely lower than eight feet. Um, and it, this is once again, easier on, you know, certain types of fruit trees, but you can do this. It just requires more, more frequent pruning. So in the first couple of years of this tree's life, in midsummer, you want to cut all of the new growth back by half, and you want to thin some branches out again for some sunlight penetration. And that same season, you may need to prune a couple more times. Remember, I said you might have to prune more frequently to achieve this. And then once the tree matures, you want to cut back the new growth above the selected tree height. So you've decided, I want this tree to be four feet tall. And then you notice the new growth and you cut it back to where you want it. And you might have to do this two or three times. And again, you might need to do some thinning cuts, kind of removing some interior branches in order to get some more sunlight in there. Um, citrus pruning. So honestly, little is required. Um, some people do prune their citrus, some people don't at all. Um, there are certain things though you should prune out, and we'll talk about that. But you can do it to control size, to control shape, the shape of the tree, um, and also to deal with suckers. So if you look at the pictures, the two pictures there, the picture on the left, see those, those bright green sprouts coming out near the bottom of the trunk there? Those are suckers and they definitely need to be removed. They're below what's called the graft union. So typically, the fruiting tree, the fruit that you want to eat, that tree is grafted on to a rootstock, which is it's grafted onto the lower trunk of another type of tree that's like really robust and strong, but usually it's fruit or nasty. So see these guys growing out from the rootstock, this is, this is not going to produce the fruit that you want to eat. And so you want to remove these as soon as you see them. That is a very necessary part of citrus tree pruning. In terms of timing, actually, I mean, you can do it in the summer, um, but early spring after any frost is best. And usually you're doing some thinning cuts. Um, sometimes people keep the skirts because citrus trees will have leaves all the way to the ground. Some people keep the skirts pruned up off the ground a bit, um, but we'll talk more about sunburn in a minute. You don't, you don't want to overdo it. Yeah, here we go, sunburn. So I keep mentioning about making thinning cuts, kind of taking out interior branches to let some light penetrate. But I did mention earlier that there's a balance you wanna strike that comes with experience. You wanna let some light in to help, enough light in to help, but not enough to hurt. And when a section of a branch or a trunk is now fully exposed to sunlight, especially Southwest sunlight, um, it can sunburn. And sunburn increases the susceptibility to pests and disease. So the picture here on the far right, where you see the bark is kind of splitting all the way up the trunk, that's sunburn. That, those are the results of sunburn. So what you can do after you prune, you notice that you've got some exposed trunk and branches, is you can, you can just use interior white latex paint that you might have in your garage, mix it with water, I've seen 50-50 mixture or 75-25 mixture, and you paint it to the parts of the trunk and branches that are exposed to the hot sun. Um, and in fact, my, my backyard and my orchard faces southwest on a slope. It's just like the perfect angle for tree sunburn. And I go out and I paint my trees in the late spring every year because I have some young ones and I'm waiting <laughs> waiting for their leaves and canopy to grow enough to protect them. And then I was out redoing it just the other day because I, I noticed some new spots that were exposed. And this is just especially, especially important after pruning because you're probably causing more sun exposure when you've removed some leaves. So do be sure to look out for that and take care of it. All right, let me stop again. Any questions or comments? Go ahead, there's a question. Unmute yourself. Uh, go ahead. Oh, okay. About the uh, slide with the suckers. Mm -hmm. Can you explain that again? You were saying that I should be cutting these uh, ones that are coming off the base of my tree off? 
yes, you should definitely do that. Anytime you see um, these kinds of branches coming out of the base of your tree, cut them off, yeah. They have a lot, they have a very characteristic long thorn. And depending on the type of rootstock, um, it has a different leaf. This one has a trifoliate leaf with three petals per, or not petals, but three leaves per section. Um, and these are the rootstock trying to take over. So definitely want to remove those all any time of year, all the way down to the side. And if you're not sure, that's a great, like Holly mentioned earlier, that's a great helpline question to take a photo and say, I'm, like, if you're not quite sure, you know, is it part of the regular tree? Is it the rootstock? You could always send that as a helpline question with a photo um, to our helpline. Okay, good. Thank you. Because I was going to say, I think that that happened to my pomegranate tree, but I'm not sure. Um, I, I'm I'm gonna call the hotline and send a picture. <laughs> yeah, and pomegranate. So this is just for citrus that has this uh, sucker. Other trees will okay, sucker, okay. but pomegranates. Um, Holly, I'm sure you've seen this. Pomegranates are almost more bush-like. So, yeah. and they're usually on their own roots, right? Yeah, it's I think they are. So you wouldn't, unless you were trying to shape it into a tree-like form. If it was pomegranate, this would be this kind of growth would probably be okay, um, and it wouldn't be thorny or a different variety like Holly said. Yeah, this is this is um, for citrus. E you'll you'll also see it occasionally for you know other um, you know like stone fruits, etc. Although you won't get the thorns, um, but but yeah, specifically for citrus, you'll see the the crazy thorns usually. And a lot of times on the uh, uh, stone fruits, like she said, then it will come out and you'll see it come out underground from the root flare. Yeah. All right. So let's talk about fertilizing um, really quickly here. So you see a bag, a generic bag here, and it has N, P, and K on it. Those are the three major nutrients or some minor, there are minor ones that plants need as well, but major nutrients that plants need. So N for nitrogen, P for potassium, and or P for phosphorus and K for potassium. I always switch those. Um, nitrous, yeah, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. And those numbers at the top that you see, that tells you what percentage of that element is in the uh, fertilizer. So if you had a hundred pound bag of fertilizer here, five pounds of it would be nitrogen, 10 pounds of it would be phosphorus, 15 pounds of it would be potassium. All right, um, so what do you do in summer? So fruit trees actually typically don't need fertilizer in summer and it can actually cause burning um, if the weather is too hot. And also some people um, use foliar fertilizer, so spraying fertilizer on the leaves. And we recommend not doing that in summer as well. It can also cause burning. So really, if you want to fertilize, um, generally fertilize citrus in spring and fall and stone and palm fruits in the spring. And so um, the, another issue too is when you fertilize, it, it typically causes a flush of new growth. And that you may not want this summer, especially because you're trying to save water and you don't need a bunch of new growth. So you don't really need to do that. But when you do decide to fertilize, probably not this summer, but when you do decide, just some general tips, don't overdo it. Only a little bit of nitrogen is required. Don't use more than one pound of actual nitrogen per year, even on a large mature tree. Other nutrients are usually sufficient. Um, you can use organic amendments, by the way, such as compost. Um, and if you decide to apply fertilizer, do it around the tree's drip line. And you can see here a diagram that shows you what the drip line is and where to apply the fertilizer. If you do have concerns about nutrients lacking in your soil, then we always recommend that you get a soil test. Uh, now soil tests usually don't report on nitrogen, but they'll report on other nutrients in the soil. Well, that was a fast one. Fertilizing is fast because 
you don't really need to do it in the summer unless there's a, a serious problem with your tree. So any any questions on that quick one? I don't see anything in the chat. And I know that our horticultural advisor, Janet Harton, has been talking about um, even if there are some recommendations to uh, fertilize fruit trees that during the drought, um, anything with fertilizer just needs more water. So like Holly yeah. said, this year, it's a good year to skip it. Yeah, I'm definitely. For the summer. Yeah, I mean, I, I typically don't fertilize my trees in the summer anyways, but I remember saying I don't either. I, you know, if I had a weird temptation, I would definitely avoid it this year, so. Yeah, and I'm not good enough at remembering to water, and I'm just so concerned. We'll, we'll get sudden heat spells, right? So I don't either. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so let's talk about pests. You can see a little uh, Asian citrus psyllid there on the lower right, just waiting to infect your tree with citrus greening disease. Um, so there's a lot that I could say about pests. In fact, I have a lot of slides and I don't think I'm gonna get to them all. So what I wanna do is talk about some broad categories of pests. And then I also wanna talk more about myths about pests and kind of like changing our mindset around dealing with pests. And then if we have time, we can talk about specific pests and disease if you want. And then also the Master Gardener Helpline is always there to help you with any pest and disease problems. So broad categories of pests, just to help us kind of frame what we're talking about here. So we have vertebrate pests. Vertebrate means with a spine. So on the lower left, you can see that really adorable little gopher that is not so adorable when it starts eating the roots of your plants. Um, so these are things like rabbits, gophers, voles, birds, deer, et cetera. And then we have invertebrate, invertebrate pests. So basically insects, bugs. So citrus leaf miner, borers, Asian citrus psyllid, scale, et cetera, et cetera. And you can see a picture in the middle there of some aphids. And then also diseases are pests. And so it could be something like citrus greening disease or crown rot. And you can see on the lower right hand, um, this tree has some sort of disease on its leaves. I actually don't know what it is, um, but it, it clearly has some sort of disease. So how do we think about approaching pests and disease? This is where I wanna talk about some myths to consider and, 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 and just to help you think maybe differently, maybe. Um, compared to how maybe you thought before. So one myth is, if there's a problem with my plant, it must be caused by a pest or disease. We get a lot of questions about this. Plant with my plants, leaves are yellow. What disease does it have? It's like, mm, it has a nitrogen deficiency or you know, it's got, there's a watering issue. So most problems are actually not caused by pest and disease. They're actually what we call abiotic. And what that means is that the problem was caused by an environmental factor. So a change in temperature or over or under watering or rain or drying wind, et cetera. So the first place your mind should go to when you see a problem is not necessarily a pest or disease. Another thing that we run into a lot is this idea that bugs are bad and will hurt my garden. And that leads to people just wanting to get rid of all bugs or if they see a bug getting you know, very concerned. But one thing to keep in mind is only a very, very tiny percentage of all bugs are harmful to plants. And in fact, the vast majority, about 97% are good, that is beneficial or neutral. That is, they don't have an effect, good or bad. So most of what you're seeing in your garden is good or kind of unimportant. Well, important for the ecosystem, but, you know, neutral for your plants. Another thing, another myth I come across a lot is if there's say holes in plant leaves, then the bug sitting nearest to the damaged part is the one that did it. And that's not always true. Sometimes the bug that's sitting closest to the damage is the good bug that came to eat the bad bug that ate your plant. So proper pest identification is key to pest management. If you don't know what bug is doing the damage or if it's even a bug, then all of your attempts to fix the problem are going to fail. And that's one place where the Master Gardener Helpline can come in uh, really handy. There are tons of bugs on plants. The one you say may, see may not be the culprit and may even be good. And sometimes the good bugs are like the ugliest, scariest ones. Like these two bugs that you see here, 
on the slide. They're both good. You want these in your garden. The top one is a ladybug larva. The bottom one I think is an ant lion or lacewing larva. And they look freaky, I think, but they are the best. You want these in your garden. In fact, when I find them, I catch them and I cart them around the plants that have aphids on them so that these guys will eat the aphids. So it's like I catch them and move them to where I want them. Another myth is if I see bad bugs, I have to kill them all immediately. And it's just, I get it. It's this kind of desire, like go to the nursery, tell them you have bad bugs, find the best, the strongest pesticide you can and spray it down. Although I, I do think the mindset of people's mindset is changing around this, but it's pretty common still. So here's the thing. There are always gonna be pests in your garden. And in a weird way, at a certain level, you always want them to be there because you need balance. You need a balance between the good bugs and the bad bugs. If you want the good bugs in your garden, you have to give them something to eat. Sometimes that's giving them the flowers and plants they like, it, you know, a certain stage of their life. But a lot of times it's allowing there to be a certain population of the bad bugs that they feed on. So if you want good lace wings in your garden, you need a certain amount, number of like, you know, white flies and aphids and things that lace wings like to eat. You, you need those in your garden. The other thing to think about is that when you go to kill the bad bugs, if you're, especially if you're using chemicals, you often end up killing the good bugs too. You destroy the balance. And in, the, in a vacuum, who fills in? Who comes into it? The bad bugs again. So you kind of create this never ending cycle by destroying the balance. Another thing to think about though is, you know, you, you don't like holes in your leaves. You don't like blemishes on your fruit. Um, so, but you might have to adjust your tolerance to imperfection. So supermarket level perfection in produce isn't feasible and it may not even necessarily be desirable because honestly, anything you get out of your garden is gonna taste a thousand times better than what you can get in a supermarket, even if it has a hole in it because a bird pecked it or a bug chewed it. You can just cut that out, it won't hurt you. Um, so you need to figure out in your mind, like how much damage can you tolerate in order to support the balance of good versus bad things in your garden. And the final myth is that chemicals are the best or only way to kill bad bugs. And this is typically not true. You need to consider how these toxic chemicals will harm your whole garden, including the good bugs, including your, you know, your pets, including you. So, and there are a lot of ways that you can manage pests and bugs without using chemicals. Spraying them off with a strong jet of water is a great, a great option. So what I'm talking to you about, it, what I've been leading up to is something called integrated pest management. It's an evidence-based approach to managing pests in your garden. And it has a series of steps or principles. So you need to identify the pest early and accurately, know what you're dealing with. One way you can deal with things is plant resistant varieties of plants. Sometimes there are plants that are resistant to certain diseases. You can find that out at your local nursery or through the Master Gardener Helpline. Use recommended cultural practices. So planting properly, watering properly, pruning properly. Remember I said not to let your tree sit in water. That's an easy way of preventing crown and root rot. Also remember, as I said, that most disorders are not caused by pests, but are instead caused by the environment. And then finally, as I've already alluded to, apply chemical pesticides only as a last resort. So let me look at the time. We only have a few minutes left. So I have examples of pests and we can go through these um, in more specific detail. Um, but when, but I, if you guys have questions after the fact, um, but one thing I just want to know is about diseases. So I think this also is important for kind of shifting people's mindset in terms of how they think about managing pests and disease. So what you see here is called the disease triangle. And what it's saying is that you have to have three conditions all operating in order for the disease to actually exist. So you need the pathogen that causes the disease to actually be there in your garden. Um, you need a host plant that's actually susceptible to that particular disease. 
And then you need a favorable environment. So it could be the right temperature for a certain disease. It could be the right humidity level for a certain disease. If you have all three of these, then your plant can get the disease. But if you are able to knock out any one of these three points of the triangle, you can prevent and manage the disease. So remember I said you could plant resistant varieties. So what if you plant a tree that's resistant to, I don't know, I'm making this up, fire blight. Well, then you're not gonna get that disease. Or in terms of a favorable environment, what if you, as I mentioned, have good watering practices and you don't let your tree sit in water, you're probably not gonna get Phytophthora or crown rot. And so it's so another thing to think about is if you can identify what the disease is and we can help you with that if you contact our helpline, then if you can manage, so you can't always manage if the pathogen's there or not. Sometimes you can't, not always, that's the harder one. But if you can manage some of these other points of the triangle, you can keep your garden safe and you can prevent this or at least reduce uh, the chances of disease happening. So what I'm gonna do, because we're at a time, I have a list of diseases, so we can talk diseases. If you guys have specific questions, we can go there. But I do want to point out resources to you that I've kind of highlighted throughout the presentation. So um, we have something called the U UC IPM website. The link is there. Um, and IPM is for Integrated Pest Management. And that can help you deal with pests and disease, all, all sorts of stuff. And if you just wanna Google it, if you do an internet search, you can do internet search and you can type in the name of the pest or the disease and then type in UC IPM or UC ANR and it'll pull up those links for you at the top of your search. And then there's the helpline with our phone number and our email address. If Maggie, I think you already maybe dropped that in the chat earlier. And then, um, of course, I wanna thank you all for coming. And you can visit our website for more classes. You can follow us on social media. And we got a helpline, as I said, and we've got the newsletter. And I think Maggie, if you can drop the link in for the newsletter. And then the last thing I wanna bring up for you all related to this um, is that we're actually gonna be doing a tree pruning workshop um, on Saturday, August 20, 22, 27th. Um, in Ontario at the Huerta del Valle Community Garden. And um, I think, I don't know, Maggie, if you were able to find out what time it's gonna start. It was eight to nine. Eight to nine, you said? Yep. Eight to nine. And you see the address there, 831 East Belmont Street. And um, this doesn't have a link to register, but if you go onto our Master Gardener website, uh, I think eventually there'll be a link there to register, right, Maggie? Yeah, so uh, how you register, if you went to the website to register for this class, then you'll see it listed up there. I'm going to put it up today. And I think they decided uh, no registration, but we'll have a link with information with this flyer and the address um, up today. Yeah, so if you want to see a demonstration and, and learn how to do some of the stuff that we talked about today, because um, honestly, we could do an entire talk just on pruning alone. Um, so you, you're welcome to check that out. And I'm gonna end here, but if you all have specific questions about anything I covered or questions about pests and disease, like I don't know how much time you have, Maggie, but I'm happy to stick around for a few minutes and, and keep answering questions. Absolutely. So if you have anything you wanna type in the chat or if you wanna unmute yourself, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, stop recording. A uh, great presentation. Wait, let me make sure I press the right button here. So thanks for joining us.